my assignment is to talk to you about humility. Authentic Adventists are humble. The text from Philippians is how Paul puts it. Your attitude should be the same as Jesus Christ, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even to death on a cross. The humility that Jesus teaches us in this moment at the cross confuses us. Why? Because the spectacle of a crucified God, we don't like it. It's devastating. We don't want God crucified It's hard for us to come face to face with a God who is less than powerful. And what we prefer is actually God on a throne holding all the symbols of power. No no wonder the cross is confusing. But this is the Christ of the cross teaching us something. What Paul tells us, emptying himself of our notions of power and teaching us that humility is the way. He's empowering other people. That's what his humility is doing. He is removing violence from the notions of power. He's actually teaching us to be humble. I didn't come here to, by the way, to lecture you on violence. We, our country, as Lisa said over and over again this morning, my country um, has a problem with violence. So what was Jesus doing at the cross? He was teaching us the humility is the path. He's earning our trust with humility. He is teaching us that we don't coerce into compliance. We are humble. And every time we, we approach everyone this way, not with a sword, but with a basin and a towel to wash feet humbly, not on a horse, but riding a donkey, this is the way of Jesus. Authentic Adventism is humble. Now, humble Adventists, I have three points and then we're done. We'll go eat. Amen, saints? Amen, sinners? Amen. All right. All uh, right. Authentic Adventists are humble. Humble Adventists, number one, we say this. We have to repeat this over and over again. We have a lot to learn. We have a lot to learn. When we come across like we have nothing to learn, that's a problem. We have a lot to learn. Can you remember that? Number one, humble Adventists, remember, we say we have a lot to learn. I actually learned this from Fritz Guy, who just recently passed away. Fritz Guy was the preeminent theologian of our church for for almost 95 years. He was 95 when he died. So, um, boy, he wasn't... I mean, he probably started when he was in the seven, maybe 70 years. Can we say that? I lived next to, I mean, I worked for 20 years next to his office. Um, so I had the privilege of walking into his office and picking his brain all the time. Uh, Fritz, uh, Dr. Guy, I, I call him Fritz away from him, but in his, to his face, I'd say, Dr. Guy, what do you think about? Uh, and he would expound. I would always take my little notebook and just write as fast as I could. I've got pages and pages that I wrote about the things that he said. I love that when he would say to students, um, Your question you should be asking in college is, who am I becoming for other people, not just for myself? Remember that, Lisa, you teach. Who am I becoming for other people? This is the the humble question to ask. Who am I becoming for other people, not for myself? um, Fundamental beliefs. He did not like the the title fundamental beliefs. He always said to me, Sam, they are statements of fundamental belief. A little nuance. And he was part of the editing of our first set of fundamental uh, statements of fundamental belief. He insisted that we say statements of fundamental belief because he thought that is the more humble way to admit that there's going to be other, other statements in the future. These are not the only fundamental. These are just statements of what we believe now. And one day I decided I want to know what we have still to learn. So I walked into his office ready with my notebook and I said, okay, let's go. You say all the time, we have a lot to learn. I've learned this from you. We have a lot to learn. We have a lot to learn. Shoot, shoot some things at me. What would you say? I scribbled about a third of what he said. And I want to list some of them to you. Um, we have to learn common courtesies, gratitude, forgiving, asking for help, differing graciously, taking the first step to resolve conflicts, boundaries, saying yes or saying no, winning and losing graciously, speaking truth and love, asking good questions, requesting feedback, seeking counsel. We have a lot to learn. Humble Adventists, we admit this, we acknowledge this every day. We have a lot to learn. 
Number two, we're going quick. We're ahead of schedule. Humble Advent is acknowledged that we live interconnected. We are interconnected. Lisa stole all of this from me this morning, but I'm still going to say it because I wrote it down and I have no other way to go. <laughs> we're a flock. And we're a body. As Paul chooses to call us a body. We are interconnected. And what happens to one part of the body happens to the other. When Becky got sick, because Japheth did so much work previous to Becky getting sick, cultivating his connection to the body, it felt like we were all sick. And when Becky died in June, we felt that like we had lost a part of our body. We live in a planet every day where we discover new and deeper and more complex levels of interconnection. And humility requires that we think about this. We humans, as Lisa reminded us over and over again this morning, we're created and designed for interconnect, for, for being in a body, for being in a flock. And we struggle with this because our, our impulse is away from that. This is sin. Our gravitational pull is away from this, this way we were created, this way we're designed to something else. What, what Michael Polanyi, a philosopher, uh, in his book, Personal Knowledge, called the absoluteness of the individual. I've read some books too. The ab- <laughs> <laughs> so he, his, he says the absoluteness of the individual is the problem of the Western world, by the way. That's primarily our problem. You're Western too, even though you're whatever. You know, you know, I know where you live, but you know, you understand the thinking of the Western, the Western mind is constantly tempted away from our design, which is to think like a body, to be humble within that body, accepting our part in the body, and trying to, and, and attempts us to think only about our own self-interests, making decisions about our own self-interests. And it affects everything, the way we live. I mean, I, I just, I mean, talking to my son um, a couple of days ago, who's in college, he says, I'm tired of living in a dormitory, I'm done, I'm getting an apartment next semester. So, but I don't know how you're going to pay for that because I'm the one funding your college experience. <laughs> I just need my own space. Oh, God. He's gravitating away from how he was designed. And someday, someday, and I know some of you who have lived in dormitories, you'll think of those dormitory days as your best days when you were living in the tightest community and you, you saw everybody every day and you were forced to think about your decisions, thinking of other, other people. If I... If I if I inhabit the bathroom for the next half hour when someone has to go to class in 10 minutes, <laughs> that affects it. You have to think. You know, the way we drive, the way we travel, the way, you know, on my way here, I prayed that no one would sit next to me because I needed my, I wanted, in, it's, you know, I want more space for myself. I wish um, someone sat next to me with a baby. <laughs> it's like God's way of saying, oh, well, yeah. You're going to preach that? I'm going to teach you how to live in the community for 16 hours. <laughs> hey, you know, I don't want to get awkward, but it also, this, this absoluteness of the individual affects our politics. It affects our theology. The humility of Jesus causes us to resist this. As one author calls it, another author I've read, as one author calls it, it is an inner blindness that is the most difficult to heal. And this inner blindness causes us to think not collectively, but not in humility thinking about how it affects every decision I make affects someone else, but it tempts us to make decisions always about me, me, me. I I love the singing here is amazing. I love it. This is, is it great? Amen, somebody. It was... The, I mean, the work that goes into putting this together and then you stand and you sing together and isn't it much better than in the car when you're belting out the songs? <laughs> isn't it better? I mean, we, we, have, we have discovered it. We have developed a technology to shove everything into a what? An iPhone, me, <laughs> an iPhone, so that we can listen to the music there instead of singing it like this, which is why when we're singing together, we discover that this is actually how we were designed. 
150 years ago, we figured out how to record music. Before that, we had to listen to it together. It's the only way to listen to music. Think about how we were designed, how we, if we're humble enough, if we're humble, we'll discover new levels of interconnection and interdependence. And could it be this is how we make progress with solving all the biggest problems facing us? Faith, the, prob, the big problems facing us. I don't mean, I don't mean you know, small problems of our community. I mean like poverty and the environment, the, the addictions that we are facing. I talked to a dear, dear brother this morning here. Uh, talking about how one of his family members is battling an addiction. It's, could it be that instead of thinking they have an addiction, it's us, we all have an addiction. Could it be that it's not that they are suffering with or, or struggling to figure out how to make the environment last a little longer until, until Jesus comes? That all of us have to, we are all in this together. Could it be that it's not they are poor in Cambodia, so let's go on a raw trip, raw ministry, what is it called? Raw industries, raw impact, raw impact. Thank you. Somebody huh? in the storm trips in England. Does that, does that happen? Great. It's not that. It's just that we are struggling with poverty. We're struggling with access to healthcare. We're struggling with access to clean water. We are all addicted. We're all struggling with mental health problems. When we think this way, when it's us, we can then begin to make changes. We have a problem with this war. It's not the Palestinians and the Israelis, it's us. We're dying. We're being shot at. Last year, I want to show you a picture. This is the, oh my word. On this screen, she looks even more amazing. This is my daughter, Alexandra. Isn't, isn't she, can you see it? Okay, no, this, okay, we'll leave it there. She's just, wow. So last year, she said, I want one of those 23 and Me kits, the genetic kits. I want to discover what I'm made up of for my birthday. And I said, absolutely, yes, because I knew uh, you'll find out what you are, and then I'll find out what I am, because I'm cheap, because then I can just look at half of you, and I'm like, that's me. <laughs> so I said yes. <laughs> and so <laughs> you, I'm, I'm going to show you the results. I know this is, you're probably thinking, no, you can't do that. I asked permission over and over again. I said, may I please show my Australian friends your results from the two or three of me? And she said, absolutely, you can do it. So whatever. Also, these things will be out in a data leak. A data leak will happen and we'll have all the information from the world. So it doesn't really matter anyway. So, <laughs> okay, so here's the results. I'm going to walk you through them because I think they're fascinating. Ah, look at this. So here's Allie. Um, all of that blue to your right is her mother. Northern European. Pretty monochrome, I mean, just one, she's pretty, I don't want to say the word pure, because that's not, that's not appropriate, but yeah, that's her mom, beautiful, um, English, uh, her, her uh, grandmother was born, Ali's grandmother was born in England, so one of you, one of your people, um, <laughs> and the rest of you too, I mean, you're all, you know, whatever it is, <laughs> but the other half is me, a little messy, isn't it? <laughs> Um, look at um, that, that sort of bluish purplish section, the biggest section there that, to the bottom, the bottom uh, quarter there. That's actually Southern European. It's, it's um, Sephardic Jewish. I know that because I know my family and they talk about that. We're Jewish. Well, how do you think we see this conflict in the Middle East? We see it through eyes that you know, me, we, we're connected. You want to know what the purple is? I'll show you. If I push the right button. The purple is Arab, Palestinian. I know that also from my father's side. We're both. So when we talk about this war... In my family, we're talking about us. And uh, my kids are talking about something that's both of them. What, what we do to each other is we're doing to ourselves. Um, I don't know how to blank this screen, and I don't want to go to the next slide, so that's a technology fail on my part. I'm being transparent. Transparent. 
Humble Adventists acknowledge that we're interconnected. Humble Adventists acknowledge that we have a lot to learn. Last thing, third, third point. Humble Adventists don't give up. We don't give up. We do not give up. We admit our failures and then we keep going. I think of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane with an option to stop, to bail, to end the journey. He had that option. That's what Paul tells us. But he emptied himself of all of the available options so that he could go humbly to the cross for us. Now, I know that we, this, this is our challenge. I want to tell you a short story. And I, and I you know, I, as, as I was listening to Japheth talk, I knew it's going to sound like we just came here to talk, to, to process our grief together. <laughs> we kind of did. So, um, um, but I promise you this story has a really good ending. Um, my father died a year ago, a year and a half ago. I loved him very much. My father was an amazing, it was the father that, um, when you pray for, yeah, he, I, I said over and over again while he was living that I wanted to be like Jesus, but if I couldn't, I'd, I'd settle for being like my dad. He was an amazing human being. He loved me, and we miss him so much. So he died of COVID, and in the last, he was sick for about a week and a half. In the last three or four days of his life, we knew because my sisters are all in healthcare. My mother is a nurse. Uh, my mother was a nurse educator. Uh, we have family who are physicians. And we, so we, we knew we were not going to be one of those families that would spend a month watching my father, you know, um, slowly, slowly die on a ventilator. We knew it's the end now. We're going to move on. Um, it's okay. So... I invited a pastor, my father's pastor, to come and pray for him and anoint him. He did anoint, he anointed him, and, and um, we all had to wear PPE because it was in the middle of one of these spikes in, in COVID. We all had to be very protective of each other. So, um, so the pastor and I, we put PPE on, and we went in and anointed him. The next day, um, someone texted me and said, have you anointed your father? I responded, thank you. Yes, we anointed him. Your care and concern, how lovely. Thank you. We've anointed my father. Then a flood of text messages, WhatsApp messages, and people posting online. Have you anointed your father? We anointed him. Thank you. So I got on Facebook, on caringbridge.org, and all, all the platforms just to settle the issue. He's been anointed. Thank you so much. We love you. Pray, pray for our family. Then I began to see all these comments. They have not anointed him. Oh, we did. We anointed him. Uh, no, uh, I don't think his son is going to anoint him. So finally, I decided to anoint my father again. <laughs> because I knew it's not, for, it's not for him. It's not for It's for the people who didn't get to witness it. They need to see this. So I began to organize a Zoom anointing service for my father with all of his friends and family from across the world. Now, I'm going to be very gentle here and just and loving, and I don't want anyone to walk out of here feeling discriminated against or like I'm ageist, but try to imagine organizing an anointing service on Zoom with 50 octogenarians <laughs> across several platforms. Like, What's up? No, uncle. You, you got to get on Zoom. I don't know how to do it. Well, let me, I'll spend an hour with you trying to walk you through every step. I created steps that I sent to everybody. We set a time. It was the wrong time for some people, but we're three hours away. That means you have to subtract three hours. <laughs> Listen, it, the, imagine the most complex human undertakings in history. The pyramids of Giza, the Apollo space, Pro, the Panama Canal, the, the, the Sydney, Sydney Opera House. It was a project of that level of complexity. <laughs> Are you with me? Finally, after a day and a half of getting this together, I felt confident that everyone now knows what we're going to do. And so we, when I walked into the room, I had spent the hour putting all the protective stuff on. I've got the gloves in my head. But, um, I walk into his room. I look around, and I realize... I forgot the oil. <laughs> but I've got everyone already signed on. 
And I am not walking out of this room to go find oil. So instead, I began looking throughout that room, looking for what Jesus could transform into oil. <laughs> what would be the easiest? What would be the easiest transition? Well, you turn water to wine, so hand sanitizer, <laughs> alcohol. That should be a pretty easy transition. So I went to the hand sanitizer, and I'm getting it. And then, because you know, again. I'm trying to. I'm super generous here, but because you know octogenarians, they don't know how to how to mute the Zoom call. I could hear them talking. They began to say things. He doesn't have oil. He doesn't have oil. He's from California. He doesn't know how to do it. It's not going to work. Someone said in Spanish, "This is not going to work." No, esto no, esto no va a funcionar. No tiene aceite. Esto no va a funcionar. I don't know what we're doing here. I can't believe this guy. His the father's dying, and he doesn't even know how to anoint his father. And the whole time I'm thinking, I'm doing this for you. He's been anointed. This 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 whole thing is for you. And then they kept going, and I, you know what? I said, forget this. Hands on the ties are off of me, and then I went to push the button. You know the button. The big bright if you don't, I'll show you an image. This one. <laughs> oh, do you remember it now? <laughs> exactly. I went to push this button, and as I was about to push it, I, you know, I, I had this this realization. Yeah, I am at the end. I have, I have been through my own grief. My father, who I love so much, is dying, and here I am making this sacrifice for you, and you don't even appreciate it. The only thing you can think about is how I'm doing it wrong. I I bet. I want to pause here for a moment and be pastoral with you, just for a second. I bet that you either have been at that place or you are there right now. You have spent so much of your time humbly. Sacrificing for someone else. I was talking to one of you who's a teacher. You've you, you've had that one student all year long. And you're like end call. Like I'm done with this kid. You've had your butt like your finger on that button about to push it. You're looking you're six weeks away. Is that when school ends here? You're like I cannot wait because I, I may not make it. I may you may have been in a relationship where you're done. You you may you may be facing a difficult trial right now. You just want to. I'm doing this, and maybe you know because this is what we love our church, and this is what we came to talk about. Maybe you're done with this church. Maybe you said I've spent too many years of my life giving and giving and giving and giving, and this is how I get treated. All the. Sleepless nights, organizing, putting things together. Maybe, maybe for some of you, it's it's your faith. You've been you've been looking for that one answer, that one piece of evidence that will help you get past this corrosive doubt you live with that is just eating at you, and and you're just ready to push that button. And it's and sometimes you maybe you feel like I act like I have faith for the sake of everyone else, but then they don't appreciate it. I, I think Jesus knows where you're at. I think so. A miracle happened for me, and it may not, may not happen for you, and, and I hope it does. I mean, here's my miracle. Just as my finger was about to touch that red button, um, a chaplain who somehow it would take an hour to explain how she became aware was standing at the door knocking with a little thing of oil, and so we were able to do it, and it was a A small grace that got us through a very difficult day. I pray, I pray that oil for you. I pray for that beautiful, gracious intervention in your life today to happen, or tomorrow, or a week from now, or whenever. But don't push the button. It's coming. That relief is coming. 
thank you, Jesus, for teaching us the, the way of humility. Thank you for enduring, for going to the cross, to teach us that this is the way. This is the way. Amen.